morning. Welcome to worship at Silver Lake Community Church. My name's Kyle. I'm the pastor here. So glad you decided to join us. Uh, right now, it is the Sunday before a very important election coming up. Maybe you're watching this after the election, in which case I'm sure that I, Kyle of the past, have nothing to worry about because everything went perfectly fine and smoothly and all that stuff. Or maybe not. I guess I will see you on Tuesday night. Well, today we're actually going to be talking about some other world-shaking major events uh, around the time of the life of this guy right here, John the Baptist. Last time we learned about John the Baptist was all the way back in January of 2020. That was a different world, huh? We actually learned about him here in the church service. Imagine that, people going to a church and sitting down inside a sanctuary for worship together, huh? I know, crazy. It blows your mind. We actually used to do that. We're actually going to be doing that again. Kind of. Next Sunday, November 8th, we're going to have a worship service in person, outside. I'll tell you more about that later. For now, let's get on to worship and the story of John the Baptist. And uh, let's start with a prayer, like we always do. Will you join me? Lord, thank you so much for this beautiful day, for the opportunity to sit down, take a break from our week, and to hear from you, to worship you. We pray that you'll open our minds and our hearts to be transformed by you in whatever way you see fit because we want to be who you have called us to be in this crazy world. We pray all these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. All right, we'll talk to you soon, but for now it's time to worship. So worship in whatever way you see fit, whether singing along to the music or sitting in silence, stand up, clap, be quiet, whatever helps you connect with God right now.
Have you been inundated with all of these election mailers? I saw a video on Facebook of Haley and Mark's son, Charlie, which basically summed up how I'm feeling at this point. Charlie, who are you voting for, Biden or Trump? Gizmo. Gizmo is their dog. I actually already voted, and I thought I'd relax a little, but I found that I was still feeling stressed. And then we had to make some changes here at the church because of some new developments with COVID stuff and had to retool our in-person service coming up for next Sunday, November 8th, 10.30 a.m. And then we had to cancel some groups that were using our space because of worries about a COVID surge. All of these big events, the election and COVID and the protests and the wildfires, the, Huge, world-changing events are rapidly shifting the way that we think and the way that we live all around the country, in Southern California, in Los Angeles, right in Silver Lake. Sometimes it seems like we're all just caught on the, the, the violent, unpredictable waves of fate. I mean, I'm the pastor of a Christian church, and sometimes I feel like all of this crazy stuff represents the true nature and narrative of the world. Chaotic. Random. I find myself wondering where, if anywhere, God is in the midst of it. Of course, I can't do anything about any of this stuff, not really, except for vote, which I did, and wear a mask, which I do. But other than that, I feel truly helpless to affect any kind of change in the problems that I see around me. I can only respond to what's happening, make the best decisions for my own life, but even the question, how do I respond? I think that the person we're discussing today in the story, John the Baptist, I have a hard time imagining he didn't at some point feel similarly to the way I do, maybe the way you feel. 
the helplessness, the sense of wanting to do something, not knowing what to do, caught on the waves. The story starts off with the news about what Jesus and his disciples have been doing, healing and miracles and teaching, the news spreading to Herod. So who's Herod? Quick and important history lesson that will help us moving forward. When Jesus is born, the king of ancient Palestine is a foreigner named Herod the Great. Though neither ethnic Jew nor Roman, Herod is commissioned by Rome to rule over the Jews. Herod rebuilt and expanded the temple in Jerusalem that had been destroyed by Babylon centuries before, part of which remains today as the Western Wall or Wailing Wall. This is just part of the platform for the temple. It was truly gigantic. He's also the one who lies to the three wise men and tries to get rid of baby Jesus by having all the infants in and around Bethlehem killed. When Herod dies, Rome gives his territory to three of his sons from three different wives, Herod Archelaus, Herod Antipas, and Philip. Herod Archelaus becomes ethnarch, ruler of an ethnicity, the Jews in this case, and rules over Samaria and Judea. Phil gets the territory that becomes modern-day Syria, and Herod Antipas becomes Tetrarch, ruler of one-third of a territory, over Galilee, the northern part of Israel. Herod Antipas is therefore the local ruler when John the Baptist starts his ministry in Galilee of baptizing people and urging them to repent. We'll pick up this story about John the Baptist and Herod in Mark chapter 6, starting at verse 14. King Herod heard about this. For Jesus' name had become well known. Some were saying, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead, and that is why miraculous powers are at work in him. Others said, He is Elijah. And still others claimed, He is a prophet, like one of the prophets of long ago. Wait, 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 hold on. John the Baptist is dead? When did that happen? How did that happen? Mark goes on, but when Herod heard this, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised from the dead. King Herod Antipas, Tetrarch of Galilee, had John the Baptist beheaded. What happened? Mark explains, Herod himself had given orders to have John arrested and he had him bound and put in prison. He did this because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, whom he had married. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. So Herodias nursed a grudge against John and wanted to kill him. She was not able to because Herod feared John and protected him, knowing him to be a righteous and holy man. When Herod heard John, he was greatly puzzled, yet he liked to listen to him. Yeah, so at some point, Herod Antipas falls in love with his half-brother Philip's wife, Herodias, who also happens to be his niece because she's the daughter of one of his other half-brothers. There's a lot of that kind of stuff going on in that time period. There's a lot of that stuff all the way up through, like, the 19th century in Europe. But anyway, taking your brother's wife while he's still alive, it is in any case prohibited by Judaism. And John was God's local mouthpiece in Galilee, and he wouldn't stand for it. John, like us, is caught up in the swell of great public current events. How is he going to respond with the little influence that he has? He speaks out. He tells the truth. He speaks what's on his heart. Herod shouldn't have done that. It was wrong. I don't care if he's the king, John says. I, I don't care what he does to me. I answer to a higher authority, and I have to do right by God before I do right by Herod. If no one speaks out, is this just going to become normal? Destroying each other's marriages? Stealing each other's wives? Interestingly, 
Herod doesn't immediately have him executed like his father, Herod the Great, probably would have. He respects John's integrity. He's fascinated by him as a righteous and holy man. He's convicted by it even. It even says that he feared John. Something about what John was saying, it got under his skin, and he could tell that this was coming from a higher authority than just an itinerant prophet preacher dressed in camel skin out by the river. He knows that his wife has got it out for John because she's like, shut up, John, I've got a good thing going on here. But he actually protects John from her because he knows that there's something about this guy and his connection to God. It's interesting. It says, sort of like he's so far gone in his corruption that he is confused when John is talking about all of this God stuff and repenting and being baptized. He's puzzled by it. And yet, he likes to listen to him. But then, Herod's wife gets her chance. Finally, the opportune time came. On his birthday, Herod gave a banquet for his high officials and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. When the daughter of Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his dinner guests. The king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you want, and I'll give it to you. And he promised her with an oath, Whatever you ask, I will give you, up to half of my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, What shall I ask for? The head of John the Baptist, she answered. At once the girl hurried in to the king with the request, I want you to give me right now the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was greatly distressed, but because of his oaths and his dinner guests, he did not want to refuse her. So he immediately sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. The man went, beheaded John in the prison, and brought back his head on a platter. He presented it to the girl, and she gave it to her mother. On hearing of this, John's disciples came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. What are John's disciples thinking, feeling, when they come and get John's headless body and take it to bury it? Failure, anger, fear, despair, hopelessness. Their leader, the prophet, the baptizer, the one who stood up for what was right when nobody else would, dead. Where's the justice? Where's God in the midst of this? In the midst of these powerful people doing whatever they want, running us into the ground. Maybe you feel this way too. The actions and whims of powerful people causing major changes in your life. Unfathomably large and complex wheels of social forces far beyond you, pressing down on you, squashing your plans, ruining your dreams, making a mockery of your life. I know a couple folks in the congregation have lost their jobs recently. I know that some of you have been victims of violence. No, none of you have been executed by a fearful, jealous political leader, but, but your lives have been altered by people in places of power, whether City Hall or Sacramento or Washington, D.C., or at work or in your family. Despair, surrender, hopelessness. Is there any other option that even feels like it makes sense. Okay, let's stop talking about this depressing story and these depressing ideas for just a minute. Uh, I got to sit down and have a Zoom call with someone here at the church, and I want you to get to know her and some of her thoughts. Hey everyone, I'm here with Ashley. Uh, why don't you introduce yourself? Um, hi, I'm Ashley. Um, I'm 14. I go to Immaculate Heart High School 
and my mom is the children's ministry coordinator at, at the church. What has COVID been like for you? Uh, what's been hard or what's been good about it? Um, COVID, it's been, it's had its ups and downs at my house. Um, it's definitely a new experience being all at home with my entire family for months on end. You're a freshman now, so what's high school like online? It's not how I wanted to start high school this year. I, I think the teachers don't know when, don't know what a lot of homework is, even though they think that we're not, they're not giving us homework. I think just showing up to school, like online school in your pajamas and a blanket is really fun. And you get to see your friends and like their rooms and stuff. Like I have a little sister, she, also does online school <laughs> just seeing her in class and seeing like get like seeing her get so excited about doing online school and seeing her friends and teachers through the screen it's also really exciting to see obviously everyone's talking about politics right now with the election on tuesday what what what's your take on politics in general politics can get like really confusing and messy um <laughs> Yep. And I feel like people aren't, they, they don't get informed enough on politics. So when they vote, they make rash, like rash decisions. <laughs> and it's, it's, I don't think that's a good thing because politicians should be more direct on what their views are and not try to confuse the audience or drag down their opponents. Um, and it should just be a lot calmer than what it is now. I think you're very, you're very right. What do you think about all the stuff for the election? For the election this year, I just don't, I mean, you can't really know where it's going to go this year because it's really high stakes and our country is really divided in on the like political views. So they can't like, we can't really see for sure who's going to win. But whoever it is, I just hope that they step up and help our country, really, because we really need it right now. What do you think is the, the biggest issue facing the whole world right now? I think it's the pandemic. People are going out with ma without masks and not social distancing. And then there's a spike in cases and they're just left sitting there like, but I was following whatever they were saying mm -hmm. and as i see this like especially in like in our country especially like among the younger people like my age mm -hmm. um, we went to san diego recently uh yeah san diego and people were out walking like without masks and stuff and we were just kind of sitting there like but they're gonna probably gonna get the virus and then also another worldwide thing is like the violence, just violence in general, police brutality in our country. There's the Nigerian police brutality going on. And it's just, I like urge everyone to like go and look at petitions, see what they can do to help because it's, it's a problem here. And then also in like other countries too. From COVID to uh, violence against minorities to um to the election the wildfires all this stuff what do you think faith or believing in god has to do with any of it in the midst of it well in my religion class we we're talking we were talking about how god has a plan for everything even if things don't go according to plan he'll make it right even though all of this is happening it'll eventually end and it'll turn out right how it's supposed to, hopefully. And I think that's just, people should just keep their faith in this time and just keep praying and hoping for the best because God will like end it all. Like it's, he just has a plan. He's just gonna end it. Thank you so much for being a uh, part of this. Uh, this. Thank you too, that was fun. Do you hear that? 14 and grappling with paradigmatic shifts in social and political life. And, and in the midst of it, she hears 
and tells you something that I think we all, including me, sorely need to hear, understand, and put into practice. God has a plan. God always has a plan. In the darkest night, in the losingest battles, in the worst circumstances, God is still moving. When Jacob's son Joseph was in jail in Egypt, waiting for execution, God was still moving. When the Israelites were trapped at the Red Sea, Pharaoh's army barreling down on them, God was still moving. When a, when a Philistine warrior champion was facing off against a shepherd boy with a slingshot, God was still moving. When the Jewish people were taken away to Babylon into captivity, God was still moving. When Herod the Great had all of those babies killed, God was still moving, using that event to put an end to the tyrannies of people like Herod. When John the Baptist is beheaded for speaking the truth, God was still moving, using that event to galvanize and to steal Jesus for the mission ahead, one that would transform the entire world. When the Spanish influenza was threatening the world in 1918, God was still moving. When the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor in 1941, God was still moving. When, when the Third Reich was threatening to wipe Jews off the face of the planet, God was still moving. When Martin Luther King was assassinated, God was still moving. When the nuclear superpowers of the world had their hands on the button and no one knew what was going to happen, God was still moving. When AIDS was still a death sentence, God was still moving. In, in 2001, and then in 2008, when it felt like the world was coming down around us, God was still moving. And despite all of the things that have happened in this crazy year, from virus to to fires, to uh, political hatred, to police brutality, to the deaths of Kobe and RBG and James Bond. And despite whatever you have lost in your life, financially, your career, your job, your friends, your family, your future, loved ones, relationships, your home, your sense of security, God is still moving. The two questions remaining are these. Do you believe it? And what are you going to do about it? If you can believe that God is still moving, if you can look back over everything that has happened in your life and see that, that God had a plan for you, that good things were coming out of evil, even in the midst of, of tragic, horrific, unjust events, God has been active in your life. If you can see that, then maybe you can trust God now and do the next right thing. Maybe now you can hit your knees and pray instead of surrendering to despair, uh, instead of lashing out at people. Maybe you can sit and be still instead of launching into a frenzy of, of busyness and empty activities that just aren't going to help. Maybe now you can choose to do the next right thing, which is almost always to do something for someone else instead of retreating and isolating into to a self-centered mind entanglement of nightmare scenarios. Maybe you can admit your powerlessness. Maybe you can ask someone for help. John's actions led to his death. And fortunately, most of us are not faced with the same choice that he had. The stakes in our lives, no matter how bad things get, really, thank God, are just not that high. We should be thankful for that. But that frees us even more to listen to what, what God is leading us to do in our lives and to make the, to make the better choices. To make choices, to live our lives, to cultivate an inner emotional thought life that is based on the idea that God has a plan, that God is trustworthy, that we can't trust everything that we see. We certainly can't trust everything we feel. God is leading us. And at some point, like Ashley said, he's going to bring an end to all of this clatter as well. This too shall pass. Trust God. God 
Silver Lake. For those of you that don't know who I am, my name's Chris and I've been the one who's putting together all of our sermons and services every Sunday for us to watch and worship together. Um, it was brought to my attention that October is Pastor Appreciation Month and so Brittany asked a favor for me if I could put together this video. So if Brittany, if you can do me a favor, and make sure Kyle's paying attention. Some people have a couple things to say to him. Hi, Pastor Kyle. I just want to tell you that I am grateful for you for being a friend, for being a great pastor, for being there for us, and for being someone we can always depend on. Thank you, Pastor Kyle. I appreciate Pastor Kyle because he's so humble and honest. I think he's a great shepherd to lead the flock. And I also appreciate it because he likes my food. Hi, Pastor Kyle. Happy Pastor Appreciation Month. Uh, though I don't know you really well, I'm still getting to know you. What I have observed and seen is um, you're passionate about your congregation and the community, which I really appreciate. Um, to my analogy of the situation would be if you were King Midas, we would all be turned into gold. Have a great month. Thank you. I so appreciate Pastor Kyle and the whole Silver Lake Community Church family. He brings so much joy and love and just empathy to his weekly sermons that it, it really brings peace to me much needed peace. So I appreciate you, Pastor Kyle, and the whole Silver Lake Community Church family. I'd like to say a few words um, about Pastor Kyle. Um, to me, you're a really true Christian leader because you're open to the mystery of God's presence. And you're able to articulate that journey in such a way through your teachings in the Bible that stimulate your congregation to go on that journey with you. Even though you're using words, um, the words are pointing to, to a mystery that uh, each person in your congregation is able to find out for themselves. And probably most importantly, though, that um, the words are not just in a vacuum, but they're uh, encouraging your congregation to live out those words through actions. Actions toward each other, actions of, of expressing God's love toward each other. 
and also, more importantly, to the community that's around you. You have your eyes open and you're participating in God's presence and God's expression in the world. And so I'm deeply grateful to, um, to know you and to be, uh, to be a part of Silver Lake Presbyterian Church. Hello! I understand it's Pastor Appreciation Month. Well, we got us a good pastor there at Silver Lake Community Church. A good pastor by the name of Kyle Yoakum. Do you know what? That man walked me to my car last night. I appreciate that so very much. I sound rather country, but I guess it's because the hat I got on. But overall, that man, he needs appreciation every day of the week. He cares so much for the community and the people of his church. He's a God-loving man, and we love him back. Most appreciate you, Kyle. There are four characteristics that I really appreciate in Pastor Kyle. First, he's kind-hearted. Next, he yields to the Word of God. Another is that he loves others unconditionally. And lastly, he is empathetic to others. Thank you so much, Pastor Kyle. Hey Kyle, just want to say thank you for everything that you do. Not only are you an amazing pastor, but you're an awesome person too. And uh, I'm glad to be able to know you. Uh, I just want to say thank you. And I appreciate you for who you are. Charlie, say Kyle is cool. Cow's cool. No, not cow is cool. But cows are cool. But say Kyle is cool. Cows cool. The cows cool. Yes, cows are cool. But <laughs> say Charlie, please say Kyle is cool. Look, it's, it's my all the ears. Yes, that is your that's your candy bag. Are candy bags cool? Yeah. Is Kyle cool? Uh, uh, but it's what? Why do I get stuck doing all this stuff? Well, let me talk about my youth, okay? I was raised in the 1700s, 1700, sometime in there. Oh, and a lot of my classmates, they were shepherds. They watched over a flock. And what I would do after I went to school is I'd go visit some of my classmates and they would be, you know, shepherds with their flock sitting under a tree with their staff next to them. And what I would do is I would bring some cheese to them. I was a really nice guy. Bring some cheese and share cheese with them, obviously. Oh, oh, I know what we're supposed to talk about, Kyle. Yeah, Pastor, Pastor Appreciation Month. Should be all year. Kyle, Pastor Kyle, what can I say about him? He is the shepherd of our flock here in Silver Lake and of many, many other people. He is the shepherd, but he's different than my classmates because he walks amongst his flock. He knows all their names. He knows their habits. He knows their spiritual needs. He's actually a pretty good guy. And what he does is he draws people towards him, which is hard to do, but he does that very well, okay? He is a great shepherd. And I wanna thank him for being the pastor and the shepherd of Silver Lake Community Church. And more important, being my shepherd and Latanya Shepherd. People gravitate towards you, Pastor Kyle. You're an amazing, amazing person. Enjoy your month, your year, and I'll bring you some cheese, okay? Bye. Hey Kyle, we just wanted to let you know how much we appreciate you and the Church at Silver Lake. Um, we just feel very blessed for having such an open-minded, forward-thinking, and fun pastor in our life. So, happy Pastor, pastor appreciation, appreciation Month!
Hey, I'm Michael in my beautiful, cold Brooklyn neighborhood today. Very grateful and hopeful today. Yeah, I started going to Silver Lake Community Church about four summers ago. Um, I was actually in LA to work on a television pilot and um, I actually wanted to go to church. And I remember I lived in a neighborhood and I passed a church one day and I looked at the church sign and it said, church starts on Sunday at 10.30ish. And I thought, okay, this is a church for me because they have a sense of humor. So, <laughs> so I went and um, the one thing I loved about it was that people now asked me what my name was. And the following week when I went back, people knew what my name was and that was really important to me because I hadn't been shown a lot of kindness um, and when I was in that neighborhood and lived there. Um, I actually ended up coming back to New York uh, right before COVID hit hard. Um, I was going on hiatus from the show I was on and um, I was going to be home for a month and then that happened so I ended up just staying and being in New York. and. You know, things here were crazy, but uh, New Yorkers are tough. And when they have situations like this and a pandemic, they get tougher. And people here really were pretty good about adhering to what they needed to do in order to, you know, stay and keep others safe. So I'm very grateful about that. Um, in terms of the protests, it was, you know, um, I'm, I'm really glad that George Floyd didn't die in vain. The protest here, you know, we're, we're, went well, and people continue to protest here, and you know, and, and it's a peaceful protest, and there's a difference between protesting and looting, and we shouldn't let looting overshadow the good work that people are doing while out there protesting um, about Black Lives Mattering, and it means a lot to a brown guy like me who has been pulled over or, or, or stopped for no reason other than because I am who I am. Life now, I am, you know, I'm getting work here and there. I am, I've been so blessed in a way because when something stops, something else starts. Um, and people have been generous in that way. Um, so I'm really grateful about that. My health, I'm doing okay. I had a spell with anxiety and that's starting to subside a bit. So I'm glad I'm working with doctors and, you know, hoping to get better. And the, the goal is to get better each and every day. I'm not, I, I'm really hard on myself. And, uh, you know, I say I'm grateful and I'm hopeful because I'm grateful for the day. Um, I'm grateful for what comes at me and to me. I'm grateful to be here. Uh, and I'm hopeful for, you know, the possibilities, you know, what the next day could bring, you know, what the next hour could bring. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm grateful and hopeful. And I hope you are too. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. If you'd like to join us in person next week, November 8th, we're gonna be having a live worship service right here in the amphitheater at 10.30 a.m. next Sunday. And if for whatever reason you don't wanna to come to that, then you can still watch us online the same way we've been doing for months. A pre-recorded service will go up at the same time, 10.30 a.m. If you do come, know we'll have all the necessary COVID precautions in order, and we'd love to see you here. Between now and then, Whatever happens with the election, whatever trajectory COVID is on, whatever earth-shattering events make the headlines, whatever tumult is happening in your own life, know that God is at work in the midst of it. Don't be afraid. Our Lord works all things together for the good of those who love him, and God's will is good and always on the move. 
Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace now and forever and ever and ever. Amen. Hope to see you next week.